Welcome everybody to this evening's webinar, everyone in attendance and those that are watching the recording. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jason Madden. I'm the Vancouver IHN campus manager, as well as the program advisor for IHN Online Pacific. And we have a fabulous webinar this evening that I'm really excited about. Um, and joining us today is Robert Tomlinson. So Robert is the co-founder of the Institute of Natural Health Technologies and Bioenergetic Intolerance Elimination. Robert's devotion to the field of allergy research, immunology, electromagnetism, and biophysics has given him insight into the root causes of disease. Robert has done extensive study in the science and practice of iridology, as well as uh, and practices various iridology methods. He's a registered bioenergenetics <laughs> bio practitioner and holistic nutritionist. His studies include quantum and biophysics, homeopathy, traditional Chinese medicine, herbology, and holistic nutrition. And this evening, he's here to take us on a journey through the fascinating world of iridology. Robert, thanks for being here and over to you. Thank you very much. Welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for tuning in and uh, hopefully I'll keep this somewhat interesting. What have I got? Would I have an hour to do this or? An hour, yeah. Uh, perfect. And then we'll do Try something. Squeeze it all in. See, I can talk about iridology forever. I can go on and on and on because I'm fascinated with it. So I'll give you my story. I started um, about 25 years ago. I went to an iridologist for the first time and we had to wait a long time to get in to see her. And I went in with my wife and I didn't know what an iridologist was. Uh, iridology was something that... Maybe I've had it, I've heard of it before, but back 25 years ago in North America, it was a hard to know, hard to come by modality. And I um, went to see this lady and she just sat down for a bit and she looked in my eyes and she says, when did you break your left leg? I looked at my wife and uh, I didn't, I don't remember filling out anything on the form. I, this is all going through my inner dialogue. Um, I wasn't hobbling or limping when I came in here. And I said, uh, I, I, I did break my left leg, but I was, I was 14 when that happened. She says, is that around the same time you had pneumonia? Yeah, um, because I was lying down and the fluid was building up in my lungs and then they're trying to, how did you know I had pneumonia? And she says, well, you still have antibiotic left in your left lung how did you know it was my left lung and how do you know I had any back? I, 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 how are you doing this? So I thought, she's a witch. Okay, she's, she's something, how, how else was she able to do this? Looking at my wife, she's looking at me, don't look at me, I, I, don't, I don't know, I've never, I didn't say anything. Anyway, uh, short story long, she explained to me how the body is, connect, is connected through the nervous system. So the brain, 60% of all the nerves in the brain travel through the eyes and they travel, they, they knit these bundles, as I'm going to show you on the chart. I'm going to bring up a chart and show you, but it's actually knits the little bundles of the, that make up the actual irids. Irid is plural. Why do they call it iridology? Uh, because irid is, uh, irids as plural for iris. So there's iris, one iris, two irids. So it's iridology. And so it actually, the nerves actually make up those two uh, iris, irids, and then the nerves travel from the iris to, uh, to the optic nerve through the hypo, uh, the um, iridology, pardon me, from the iris to the uh, neurotransmitters, pardon me, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think this, oh, I mean, you think I would know this by now, I've been doing this long enough, but anyway, the nerves travel from the eyes to the uh, down the spinal cord to the actual tissue in the body, and then it goes back up through the spinal cord to the brain, through the eyes, and there's a continuous loop through of nerve fiber that travels from the brain through the eyes to the body. And so anytime there's a problem in the body, this is a subluxation of disease, subluxation is a pinching of a nerve, disease, atrophy, injury, inflammation, something going on. Somewhere in the body, it mirrors a tissue change in the eyes. So um, what the, this uh, German doctor, Ignaz von Pexley, in the mid-1800s looked at this. And he says, hey, there's an actual 
uh, we, we see there's a change in the actual eyes. Now, a doctor would hold a scope up to the eye. They have a basic all idea what's going on because they're looking through the pupil at the back of the eye, at the optic disc, the optic nerve, and the retina. And they have an overall idea what's going on in the body, but they neglect to look at the most important part, which is the irids, because that is the only place on the human body where the nerves are exposed to the outside world. So you can literally see how things are going and all the tissues going on in the body through the eyes. Now, well, we don't know this here in North America, but you know, there are resident iridologists on staff in hospitals in Germany and in Netherlands and Italy and Korea and Israel and many, many, many places. You actually have to be a medical doctor to be an iridologist in Russia, um, in, Australia, many iridologists work in conjunction with the doctors in the clinics and they fill pre prescriptions based on what the iridologist finds. South America, Central America, it's a university degree to be an iridologist. But nobody really knows what one is here in North America. Now, uh, we're very closely linked here in North America with the pharmaceutical companies and they want the doctors to be able to reduce symptom rates um, with your with the drugs this is no secret or it's no slander against them it's just that's what happens they want to test their drugs at reducing symptom rates and then they can uh, by percentages basically and then we'll gather those stats and they can sell them to billions of dollars to foreign markets so they want to see how effective their drugs are at doing the work for them and many people blame medical doctors. You know, all they want to do is give me drugs. Well, what does MD stand for? Most people say medical doctor. No, it stands for doctor of medicine. So if you go to see a doctor of medicine, they just, they're going to want to, they're basically their own arsenals to give you medicine. So it's not their fault. Um, but I don't like the idea that the government wants to take away our our freedom of choice to be able to choose what kind of medicine we want to receive. And I've seen over the years, I've been in practice now for 35 years, I've seen more and more and more of the window closing on natural health practitioners. Um, there's enough of them that will demand it. I don't think they'd ever be able to get rid of us totally, but uh, for, it's making it, they're making it tough on us, let's put it that way. But you know, the more of us just keep demanding it and keep uh, practicing and learning this stuff. And the more we know, the more we practice, it's gonna get more and more and more popular. And I, I think you're gonna see it start to really, really, really grow in, in many areas. So one way, one way we're really trying to get the word out is through iridology because it's so recognized around the world. There are resident iridologists on staff in hospitals, as I was saying. So when a patient comes in a coma, in a, tra a trauma, uh, in a trauma ward, in a coma, pardon me, um, there's no bleeding, no bruising. You can't ask them what happens. So they have to ask the iridologist uh, to come down, the resident iridologist, and assist the surgeons. They look in the irids of the patient, and then they can tell the surgeons what's going on. We also work with forensic pathologists doing autopsies to tell them the probable causes of death. Again, no bleeding, no bruising. They just found a cadaver. This person has died. We don't know what's happened. So often the iridologists assist the surgeons to uh, or the forensic uh, uh, you know practitioner to to see to what's going on any path pathological issue that could have gone on the eyes roll cord information two weeks after a person is deceased so there's a lots of information in those irids so I'm going to actually show you share my screen with you here uh, let's bring it up here okay there we go. And uh, so you can see the picture here. It's a beautiful picture of a blue iris. And uh, you can see all these little tiny, tiny nerve fibers here. Beautiful. That's a great picture. And then you're going to notice other things like this little orange spot, this, you know, this white up here, this grayish color. I'm going to go through all that with you. I'm going to explain it to you what that all means. So let's go through this here. So first off, um, and, and most people will tend to call it 
iridology as opposed to iridology. And I just did a joke here. It's an iridology, not iridology. <laughs> it's a study of the eye and not the ear. Um, but, uh, and I explained why. Well, iridology in ancient Egypt was actually, they actually figured that the, um, the priests were actually working on the Pharaoh by looking in the eyes because they could see levels of health in the individual through the eyes. And so they, were, um, they found ancient papyruses in, and they've got them in the Cairo and Alexandria museums in, in Egypt. Well, those are reeds that are woven together and this is what they used to print on or paint on. And so these, this was a picture of an actual papyrus that was found. And this is the priest actually doing some kind of iris, and, uh, iris analysis on the actual pharaoh. And they were able to tell levels of sickness that someone was going through by the eyes. <clears throat> All right. Um, and ancient, there's a history of iridology. Ancient Chaldeans, 2000 BC, were writing notes and, and they were journaling um, different people's eyes and they could see different sicknesses that, and, and they're drawing little markers in the eyes when certain people had different sicknesses and, and they were able to tell this 2000 BC and then the Chinese Ming Dynasty documentations between 1300 and 1680 um, they were seeing that uh, they're doing a lot of drawings of the actual whites of the eyes called the sclera. I'm also a sclerologist, not just an iridologist. I actually um, teach sclerology myself, but there is so much information. The little tiny red blood vessels you see in the eye um, are actually, the shape of them actually tell you the pathology of what's going on. It's very interesting. And the, the actual position where they are in the sclera actually tells you where the issue is. It's very fascinating. And it's a lot more actually in depth than iridology. So um, in the early 1900s, this is where this German doctor, Ignaz von Pexley, he coined the term iridology. It used to be called ophthalmic somatic analysis. So that was a mouthful. So iridology was much easier to, uh, to say. Now here's a chart that I put together in 2003 um, and the reason I did this is because I was teaching a lot of iridology even back then. And um, the charts that were out there were so complicated. So one of the students said, is there any way to make a, an easier read map of the iris that would tell you in order what to look at? And I said, well, maybe I can do that. And so this is when I came up with this one here. And so you can see up in the top corner, it talks about the digestion. Look at this one first, then the assimilation, the elimination uh, channels, and the circulatory lymphatic. And then we start looking at the nervous system. And then we start looking after that. It was, it's what's called the splits in the fiber. When, when a problem starts in the body, the fiber starts to split open, which I'll show you lots of pictures of that. But a lot of layman iridologists look at those first. That's the last thing you want to look at is all the lacunae. That's what they're called. And I'll, I'll explain that as we go along. Um, so the first thing we, I want to share with you tonight is just there are two true eye colors. There's true blue, as you see here, and there's true brown. And you notice that true brown is, is a deep chocolate brown. There's no other color variations in that. It's either true blue, as I was showing you, and that's, there's just a pure, beautiful blue color, true brown. Now there's a genetically mixed eye as well. And uh, that's a combination between blue and brown mixed together. But you'll notice there's colors in here. There's, you see yellow and there's white and there's red brown and there's orange in here. They all mean something. And I'm gonna explain that to you. Um, this is what they call the newer type of iridology, the new, newer form of iridology, but uh, many iridologists around the world practice this right now. And, and I'll, I'll get into that in a minute. Now, one of the first things we look at when we're looking at an eye and somebody comes in, I want to know how, what's their ability to hold on to vitamins, nutrients, and minerals? How strong are they? How re resistant they are to sickness and disease? 
What's their potential longevity, et cetera, et cetera. And this is what the constitution is. A constitution um, is basically saying, what is your makeup? So do you notice how close these fibers are together? Really, really tightly knit fibers. So the tighter they are, the more, well, the stronger the constitution. So the more resistant they are to sickness and disease, the more they're able to hold on to vitamins and nutrients and minerals, and the, and the more potential they have to live to be a long life, well, over 100 years of age. This person could coast over 100, actually. Uh, they have to watch their blood sugar. And how do I know that? I'm looking at this orange color, which I'll explain to you a little bit later. And uh, so those are some things we look at. And then, so this is a strong constitution. Then we look at someone who is a weak constitution. And some of you are probably already going, oh, what a difference. Yeah, there is a difference there. You see how the fibers are very torn up. They're very loose. That means this person is not able to hold on to vitamins, nutrients, and minerals very well. And the person is also very prone to getting sicknesses and diseases. And also, they, will, they can still live to be over 100 years of age. A weak constitution person can live just as long as a strong constitution person. Now, that is the way you're born. You cannot change your constitution. You can't make it stronger. So let's say you have both husband and wife with a weak constitution. But if they really take a lot of nutrients and they take a lot of minerals, et cetera, et cetera, they can actually create offspring, a, a child with a stronger constitution than both mom and dad. And if they were to really work on themselves and they marry somebody and they work on themselves and they have children, they can be stronger and stronger and stronger. So you can actually increase the strength of a constitution over generations. But in your Lifetime, you will not change that constitution you have. So when we look at this, and we say this person's got a, a weak constitution, this person, they're gonna need to baby themselves. So let's compare these two together. Let's look at the strong constitution again. So let's compare this constitution, this fiber type as let's say some, like, a, like wood. So this is an oak, very strong, very hard wood. It's very dense. You see how the fibers are really, really close together, packed in together. So it's a very hard wood. And so this can take a lot of abuse. Whereas you take a person with a weak constitution, it's very porous, it's a soft wood. It's like pine. Maybe this person is probably more like balsa wood, if you know what that means. So balsa wood is a very, <laughs> it's actually a very, very soft wood. So which one will last longer? Would it be the oak table or the pine table? Obviously we would say the oak table, but if you really baby the pine table, it will last just as long as the oak table. So this person can live to be over hundred, but you have to really baby them. This kind of person with a weak constitution. And when, and, and I'm gonna show you a lot of slides that you yourselves as, as a nutritionist that don't even have an iridology background, I'm gonna give you enough information to make it very, very useful in your practice. It makes it very, very interesting because you can look at them two to three feet away. Of course, you're both wearing face masks, right? Can't get that close to people these days without a face mask on. So, but, um, and I'm working, I'm working within two, three feet of someone's face all the time. So I've got my goggles on or my shape, face shield and my mask. Crazy times we live in. So, um, but I'm gonna show you these things that you can see two to three feet away and you can look in someone's eye, just get a little, light if you have to and shine in their eyes and you can see those fibers. And if they're very loose like this, you know this person's gonna need a lot longer time to heal. Whereas uh, the strong constitution, you can give them the same protocol, but in a much shorter duration. Or if you're taking a supplementation, um, you know, some kind of protocol that you're putting them on, this person can, they can don't even have to take as many herbs as the person with a weak constitution because they can absorb it better and hold on to it. But a weak constitution, so think of this. See my hand here, its fingers are very tight together. What would hold water better, that or that? Okay, obviously when my fingers are closed as opposed to them apart. So it's like this person, 
this is like the fingers, the, the fibers that are spread out. So they're not able to hold on to those vitamins and minerals as well as the strong constitution. So it's very important in, to take that into consideration when you're looking at somebody and say, well, I know this person is going to, to really need a supplementation program that's going to last longer than, let's say, a strong constitution. Now, this person here, they need lots of minerals. Whenever you get a very weak constitution, very torn up fibers like this, they need lots and lots and lots of minerals uh, for the rest of their life, actually. And if they really baby that, they're able to hold on to lots of vitamins and minerals, both, then they, they will last just and live just as long as the strong constitution people, okay? All right, so here's some basic iris markings that I wanna show you. And uh, again, this is, Iridology 0 0.01, <laughs> 101 point, you know, whatever. So, uh, so I want to show you the markings that are in the fibers. When the fiber, when there's a problem in the body, again, um, optics, the uh, optic nerve, optic thalami, that's what I was trying to say earlier. And then that's connected to the central nervous system, which goes to the tissue in the body and then goes back up the spine to the brain. So whenever there's a problem in the body, and then uh, it tells the brain tells the eyes and the fibrils will split. So you see over here at this end, right around uh, nine o'clock, that's the thyroid. Um, and so we can say, okay, I'm not allowed as I, an iridologist here in North America, I, I'm not allowed to diagnose and say you have a hypoactive thyroid. Well, I can tell there's two lobes to your thyroid is the left and the right side, left lobe and the right side. Well, I can say, this is the left eye, and this correlates to the left side of the body. What happens on the left side of the body shows up in the left eye. What's on the right side of the body shows up in the right eye. So when I see this and that lacuna there on the left eye, I know that the left lobe of the thyroid is in a weakened state. But I'm not allowed to say you have this, and I'm not going to give it a medical diagnosis. I just say, well, there's an imbalance in that thyroid. I can't even say it's weak. I just say there's an imbalance. The government sets very gui straight, strict guidelines for us of what we can and cannot say. But I can see that their left lobe of the thyroid is not as strong as, the, uh, it, is, as it should be. So I know they're gonna have some kind of thyroid issues. Now, so, but do you notice um, there's two different types of the splits in the fiber called lacuna. Now it's a lacuna singular or lacunae for plural. So this is, there's, there is a lacuna here, but there's many lacunae in the eye. Now, when you see it closed, see how this one's closed on this end? It's closed on both ends, kind of look like an, uh, a football a little bit. And here's another one. Here's another closed lacuna. Closed lacuna mean that's, that's an inherited weakness. That person was born with this. So they always had that. It runs in the family. When it's open on one end like this, like you see up here at 12 o'clock, and, and this side is open here at uh, the one I was showing you for the thyroid, they weren't born with a weak thyroid. They developed a weak thyroid in their lifetime. This is, a, this is just a part of the brain called the vitality segment of the brain. Here is up in the neck here, left side. Uh, they, they weren't born with a problem with their neck, but they've developed one in their lifetime. So that's an acquired weakness here when you see an open lacuna. A closed lacuna is basically, it's a little harder for the body to heal because the body has encapsulated it. It's got, it's built up walls around it to try to maintain it into that area. Um, so it takes longer for the nutrients to go into that specific area of the body. Whereas an open lacuna is easier because nutrients can flow in and out and toxins can go out of that area. So the body can heal those areas much, much quicker. All right. So Again, that's for showing something that's inherited or, uh, or if it's acquired, okay? Here's a map of the iris again, iris again here. So what you're looking at here in the left eye was the thyroid here. That's what we're looking at here, or we were you looking at earlier. So this is kind of a, now as you're looking at this, if you were to have a person standing in front of you, that's their right and their left, not your left and right. So that's their right eye and your left eye. It's opposite what you'd be seeing or on yourself. So as you can see on the outside, that's the skin. The very outside rim is the skin. Just on the inside of that is the circulatory system or the circulation or the, 
the circulatory system. And uh, on this side here, you've got the hand and the arm, and this is the thigh, the knee, the foot at six o'clock. Now, if you look at the left eye, this is their left arm and hand and the right thigh, knee, foot. And in the very center, you have the stomach. Encircling the stomach is the small intestines, the large intestines. So it's as if somebody, for lack of a better way to explain it, was standing here like this, if you can see this, at my hands on a 45 degree angle. And um, that's basically anybody in any race, that's what their eye looks like. This jagged kind of funny thing right here you're seeing at uh, around eight o'clock in the left eye here, that's the spine and four o'clock in the right eye, that's the spine down here. The very point is the tailbone and the sacrum, the, the uh, lumbar, mid back, upper back, and the scapula. That's, so it's, it's amazing how it's laid out. Now the heart, if you notice it's, it's, it's a very close mirror between the two of them, but it, there are slight changes. Over here on the right side, you see the appendix. You don't see the appendix on the left side. Um, and this is the cecum, and it goes up to the ascending colon, across the transverse colon to this side, and then down the descending colon, the sigmoid, and the rectum, the anus, which, um, so that's basically how it is in the body, where you see the, um, it basically you can see the, the ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, so it's just, it's almost like looking at an x-ray. I'd love to look at you know, people's eyes and I can see the condition of their colon and I can tell them where they're going to have a problem and what part of their colon is from this by looking at the map. It's really uh, fascinating. Okay, so another thing that we, one of the things we do see a lot of are these little freckles that you see in the eye. People say, I got this freckle in my eye and I never knew what that meant. And some of you watching right now say, yeah, I've seen that in my eye. Well, you may have been uh, you may have had that when you were born, or you might have developed it later on in life. But what it typically means to have a hyperpigmentation, which means a chemical spot that's in the body, some kind of chemistry that's taken in the body, maybe from a vaccine or medications you've had, um, whatever chemicals you've, ex you've exposed yourself to, absorbed through your skin, you breathe in or whatever, but they, they stay in the body. But chemistry, the chemicals that go in your body are, are clear. They're, they're not orange or red brown or brown or yellow or whatever. So what causes them to change color? Why would they be color like that? Well, this is really interesting. And this is more of the um, uh, Europeans and Australians that were really starting to make this uh, very familiar with most iridologists in the body. Now I'll explain this to you. I'm no psychologist, but this is what we're trained in iridology and most iridologists in Europe go by, every time you go through a different emotion, there's a part of the brain called the hypothalamus that releases a chemical called a neuropeptide. Now there's around 272 different neuropeptides they've discovered. And there's roughly around 272 different emotions we go through too. So what they've noticed is every time you go through a strong emotion, there is a different neuropeptide released with each emotion. And certain neuropeptides, <clears throat> excuse me, when they mix with the toxins, there seems to be a chemical reaction that it actually causes a combustion. It actually changes the color of that chemistry. I, I don't know if you remember in chemistry, and I remember this from grade 12, even university chemistry, they will say, here, here's two test tubes of clear liquid. And then they dump them into a beaker and instantly it turns red or blue. Well, that was this chemical reaction when the two chemi chemicals meet. So when the neuropeptide that's released from the hypothalamus mixes with the toxins that exist in our body, there is a chemical change and it changes the color of those toxins. So let me explain what this means. So when I see white in an eye, I'm not talking these two little white circles you see here, that's the flash, but the white color, now like maybe at six o'clock, you'll see right down here, there's kind of a white cord or a, a a bunch of uh, fibers together. I will show you better pictures of it, but white um, means inflammation. Physiologically, it means that there's inflammation or irritation in that area. But there's an emotion behind a lot of white. It, it says this individual usually has unforgiveness issues or they've been hardened from life. 
you know, life's been tough. They learned to just grit their teeth and just bear through it. And they, they, they hardened through it. Um, but, but unforgiveness issues, you um, know, I don't have any unforgiveness issues. People say, okay, well, um, maybe you're saying, well, I'm adult now for heaven's sakes, things happened to me as a kid. Yes, of course. Uh, you know, many things happened and made me upset and whatever, but it happened to me as a kid. I'm adult now. Why would I have a unforgiveness issue? Well, did you actually forgive the person or did you let years heal over that hurt? And then you just kind of out of sight, out of mind kind of thing. But feelings buried alive never die. There's a great book on that by Carol K. Truman. It actually talks about people that bury things, that things have happened a long time ago. And then over years, you let layers build on top of it. And, and that manifests as some kind, of a, um, a, some kind of a disease down the road. So maybe you haven't had, maybe you have no, un, no unforgiveness issues, pardon me, for someone else. Maybe it's towards yourself. Maybe I, you haven't forgiven yourself. Maybe you haven't forgiven something, something you did or you didn't do in life. So, you, you know, I tell people that and I say, you need to think about that because, you know, it's been many, many years we might have buried something. So you need to dwell on something for a couple of weeks before you just jump and say, no, I don't have any unforgiveness issues. And most of us actually do, believe it or not. Now, what's the yellow that we see in the eye. Not such a good picture of it here, but there's some yellowish color down here and around the periphery here. Well, when you have another uh, emotion of fear, worry, concern, anxiety, uh, those things there, they release another neuropeptide, mixes with the toxin, turns it yellow. Now that same neuropeptide that mixed with the toxin turned it yellow starts to affect the adrenal glands. So whenever we see yellow in an eye, we know that there's stress on the adrenal gland. If, the, if you see orange in an eye like we see here, well, when you, uh, if it's a bright orange, like almost a pumpkin orange, we know that's a recent grieving within the last year, year and a half. Say so with some kind of a grieving process. And that what you're seeing here is more of a darker orange around the center here. When we see that dark orange, let me just keep track of my time. Yeah, okay, we've got a little bit of time, so I better fly here. Um, when we see a darker orange, that's from a long-term lack of joy in someone's life. There's a difference between joy and happiness. You can be a happy person, but it doesn't mean you're necessarily full of joy, especially if you have this yellow in your eye. How could you be full of joy and worrying all the time? Fear, worry, anxiety. And so let me, I, I've had somebody argue with me and says, I'm not a worrier. And they had green eyes. What's a green eye mean? There's no such thing. I showed you as a true blue and a true brown and the genetically mixed eye, which looked like an orangey eye. We call it a hazel. So what is a green eye? A green eye is really a blue eye with yellow toxins over top of it, because there's no such thing as a genetically green eye. Well, I was like that since I was a baby. Yes, we inherit the emotions of our parents and our grandparents. And then when we go through the emotion, the neuropeptide releases mixed with the toxins in our body and discolors it. When we put a different color over top of the iris fibers, we get a different eye color. So these green-eyed people, um, a lot of them will admit, yeah, I got lots of worry, I got fear, I got anxiety, whatever. But some say, no, I don't have any. Well, don't think of anxiety as a panicker. Here's an anxious person. I'm going to demonstrate for you. Here you go. Here we go. Did you see that? How many caught that? Let me do that again. Here we go. Here's an anxious person. You'll never know it's an anxious person because they hold it all inside, a lot of them. So on the outside, I'm calm and cool, just gliding on the water like a duck. But what you don't realize is the feet are doing this under the water and you don't see that. All you see is them gliding along the top of the water. And uh, on the outside, they're calm and cool. On the inside, there could be wound up tighter than a banjo string. But that's a typical worrier. And, and they're just think, I'm, I'm sitting nice and quietly like this. Okay, I get to the bank by four. I got to make sure this is in by Monday. I got to call this person back, you know, things on the mind. So let's not say worry and fear, but let's say concerns, right? Concerns is based on still a fear. All right, so let's go to the next picture here. Um, now, 
for a nutritionist, I put specific pictures on this presentation for you, just so you have a better, it would be better, more beneficial for you to, again, you can look in someone's eye. Now, around everybody's eye, let's go back to this last one. Uh, that's it, and that's kind of a hard one to picture too. Let's look at this chart. See here, you've got a jagged line that is should be fairly round, and it should be one third of the way from the pupil to the edge of the iris. One third, one third, one third. So this is where it, what's called the collarette. It's your central nervous system. It separates the paras, the sympathetic nervous system from the parasympathetic nervous system in here, the gastrointestinal tract. So um, this jagged line is, an, is evident in every eye. So this one here, if you can see it on your screen, I'm going to try to trace it here. You can see this jagged line here. See that? That's one of the very first things we look for as iridologists, because that's going to tell us a lot about that person. That's very, very important. It literally separates the stomach and intestines from the rest of the body. And uh, we need to know that. But look at this person. I'm going to demonstrate it for you. I'm going to draw it here. So here it goes like this. Now it's much further out from that. You see it's way out here. And then zip, it pulls in sharply and then goes back out. When it does that and pulls in quickly, that's called a, um, that's a stricture. Colon's going along and goes pinch and then opens up again. Pinch in that one spot. That's what's happening there. So we can tell by looking at an eye exactly where the pinch is in someone, it's in the small intestine and uh, they've got a, a pinch. And that's, that's usually caused from either a food intolerance or it's caused from um, holding in something, holding hold in an emotion. Let's keep going. So let's follow this around a little bit. So I gotta find, there we go. So it moves around here and all of a sudden it drops down very close here and then goes back out. That's called a spasm. That's actually intestinal spasm. That's when it pinches holds for a while, and then it, then it opens up again. So there's a part of the colon that's all constricted like this, then it opens up. So that's what this is at the, at the top here, or it goes in a little bit longer. Then it goes back out again, and it follows its, its way around here. So it should be fairly round, but that's called a spastic bowel. So it's pinching, it's ballooning, it's pinching. So if you look in the colon, it's pinching, it's ballooning, it's pinching, it's ballooning. So this is what this is. Uh, medical people may refer to this as irritable bowel. You know, irritable bowel means your guess is as good as mine. I don't know. You're, you have an irritable bowel. So, but what causes it? That's from a lot of emotional issues that people go through and they tend to hold it in a lot. Um, and it also is from food intolerances on a physical basis. It's food intolerances cause this as well. But there's something in the brain to the gut. It's called a brain gut reaction. The brain releases serotonin, tel or sorry, dopamine, tells the stomach and through the vagus nerve, and then it releases something called serotonin, and that inst instigates the stomach to produce hydrochloric acid, and it causes the stomach to spasm like this. And this is typically what you'll see a lot, and it's a brain gut reaction that people are having that causes. You know, you know these people because you ask them something and said, when you get some kind of an anxious thought, do you get butterflies in your stomach? Yes. See, that's the uh, dopamine serotonin reaction in the gut. And this is a prime example of what it looks like. So this person would need things like magnesium to release that bowel, open it up a little bit. And uh, maybe some nervine herbs or B vitamins and calcium, magnesium, something like that. Relax the colon, feed the body uh, B vitamins so that, the, um, so that everything can calm down somewhat. But they definitely need magnesium to open that up. All right, so let's, let's move on here. A balloon bowel. Now, if you notice this, uh, I'll draw the pattern out, the uh, collarette. It's moving along like this, and it goes way out here like this, almost to the edge of the iris. Then it comes back and balloons out again, blah, 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 blah. Now, this is a guy, you know, you all know them. His name is Ronnie, and Ronnie has this huge, how can I say this, Molson muscle out in front of him. He's got this big gut, no butt. He's not, he's kind of chunky, but this huge gut on him, it sticks way out. And so 
when the colon gets impacted, really a colon is just a little bigger than a toonie and it's about four feet long. I have seen pictures have, of people, uh, of doctors who have re removed bowels that are about this big around and 10 feet long. The colon just keeps stretching and stretching and stretching. And the peristalsis is kind of a, I don't know how else to do it. It's a snaking movement like this that keeps pushing, 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 just keeps pushing like this, pushing food down inside of it. And um, so this person, it's what you're looking at here at around uh, two to three, two to four actually here, this big balloon part. That's the, that's just the colon so impacted. And uh, so interestingly enough, when you see a really, really large colon like this, and where this, it goes out, this person's usually very extroverted. They're the type that you want to invite to every party because they're, they're just, you know, life and life and of the party, they lampshades on their head and a whole bit. But, but the people who have the colons pulled in really, really tightly, which I'll explain in this a little bit more, a little bit later. Those are the people who have, um, they're very introverted, they hold a lot in. Well, this person with a large balloon bowel, they need something to stimulate their colon. They need bitter herbs. They need something to increase the parasolsis. That's what bitters do. And it produces, helps the, li the liver to produce bile, which lubricates the colon, but also certain herbs like turkey rhubarb, cascara sagrada, whatever, that'd be great for this person because it actually stimulates the colon to push it out. I wouldn't want to give this person magnesium. The last person in the world, I would want to give magnesium is to this person. So if you look in the eye and you see this, this uh, jagged line going around with all this dark area here, it's just spread right out through a lot of the eye. You would not give this person magnesium. You want to give this person something to increase the peristalsis. Uh, now the person before that I showed you here, no, not even before that. Uh, actually, let me look ahead. I, there's some good ones ahead that I want to show you. Like this one here. Here's a great one here. It's closer. See, I'm going to draw that, that uh, collarette right here. It's a little bit closer. Um, so this person, if they had a constipation issues, I'd give them something to, to loosen. I would give them magnesium because it would open up the colon and get the, perist the, the peristalsis of the colon moving. Now this one I wanna show you because this is called a prolapsus of the colon. So there's a jagged line goes along here, it's fairly round, gets to the top of the eye and goes straight across. You see that? That's when the transverse colon that goes across our body drops down. It, it hangs down like this. And um, one of the questions we always ask people uh, on this picture, we say, why is this person, why does this person have a hard time traveling long distances in a car? Just like that. And uh, an experienced iridologist will look at, well, they've got a prolapsus of the colon. So when that transverse colon rests down, it pushes down on the bladder and flattens it out. So the, the bladder has less room to collect liquid and it triggers the uh, response to have to urinate much sooner. So when we see that, this hanging down like this, for, for women, it tends to uh, flatten out their bladder and it can actually prolapse their uterus as well. Uh, for men, when you have a prolapse of the colon like this, it, 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 it hangs down and sits on top of their prostate, which actually causes more prostate issues for men. So there's some little things that I'm showing you. I don't want to give you a whole... Uh, lesson on anatomy, physiology, and pathology, but I just wanted to really show you some of the things we can actually see. And by the way, this is the tip of the iceberg, which I'm going to show you tonight. There's so many things you can see from the ice. Um, venous congestion. This is a sign that we look at. See the blue out here? It almost looks like this blue color ran onto the white, but out here's the circumference of the actual iris, but this is on the outside. See, there's the outline of the iris there, but what's all this blue out here? So when we see the blue out here, and by this way, this is this could be in a brown eye as well. You still have that blue on the outside. So there's a blue or brown iris. When you see this blue out here on the white of the eye, the sclera, that is indicative of a person who has who is very low on iron. You just look at a person's eye, oh, you're low on iron. Now that's so much easier than getting a blood test and to find out if you're low on iron. Here's another way we do it. See, I'm wearing a gold ring. It's my wedding band. 
And this is white gold and yellow gold mix, but you can use rose gold, you can use white gold or um, white gold, yellow gold, rose gold. And what you do is you take it lengthways like this, rub it on your cheek. I know you're all gonna to wanna to try this. And you just rub it about 10 times, not length, not like this, lengthways up and down like that. Do it 10 times in the same spot. If it goes gray, I think I'm all right. <laughs> if, it, if it goes gray or, or black, the darker it is, the lower you are in iron because the oil on your skin, when your hemoglobin is low, the oil on your skin gets very acidic, which will oxidize with gold. That's a really inexpensive way and an easy way to find out if you're low on iron, just by looking at that. So once we see that ring, I like to pull my ring off and I say, rub it on your face like this. And sure enough, you know, some women, they do this on both sides. They look like Pocahontas, you know, the makeup, but it, it, cause it's so dark and it comes right off very easy, but that's an indication of oxidis, oxidization or oxidation, pardon me, to gold, which means their iron is low. So it's a, it's a, it's a great way to do that. But that's one way, that's one of the things we look at in the eye that's low, uh, that shows that they're low on iron is that blue, ha uh, blue uh, halo or ring around the actual iris. All right, uh, Arcus Lipoetus is something else. Um, the North Americans refer to this as they call Arcus senilis but they're trying to do away with a lot of the words that the North American iridologists were using and try to make it a global unified of iris language, or I should say iridology language. And so we're calling this Arcus Lipoetus, lipid meaning fats or, you know, uh, it could be cholesterol or whatever, meaning hardening of the arteries but we can't come out and say that legally. So we just say Arcus Lipoetus, but that's what this means. It's hardening of the arteries. And uh, the head, if you look at the chart, or if you remember that chart, I mean, did you all memorize that chart? I'm just gonna tell you right now. The, uh, at the, about, if you look at it from a clock, from 11 to one in that area here, that's the brain. And so this is saying the cerebral vessels in the brain are hardened. And so the upper body is all hardened arteries. And so this person, um, they're going to start forgetting, you know, what did I come in here for? I was just saying something. So the first thing to go is short-term memory loss. Now, this person would have good long-term memory. They were going to a party 20 years ago, and they can remember who was there, who was wearing what, what foods you ate, what conversations you had. No, I'm talking people just walk in the room and go, what the frag was, I just come in here. I was just, I just, I just came into something. I was just saying something. I can't remember what I was saying, that kind of thing. And it's not, it's not Alzheimer's. It's just that you don't have enough blood flow to the brain. So you're forgetting things. That's, that's very typical for Arcus Lipotus. And it could be from a calcium deposit or it could be from cholesterol and, and fats and triglycerides, things like that. Okay, so, um, so when you look at this person, uh, you can say, okay, um, we're going to have to put you on a protocol to start cleaning out your arteries. And you can see that really clearly from two, two and a half feet away. You can just look and say, open your eye real, real wide. Sometimes they have to open up their eyelid like this. And you can look at it and say, okay, we're going to have to start working on, you know, this issue that you have of congested arteries. I don't even know if you want to say hardening of the arteries. Just say you've got congestion in the arteries, especially in your brain area. Um, okay, so, and there's another one. Here's another thing that you can see quite often, often with brown eyed people, true dark, dark brown eyed people, they'll have this brown coloring in the sclera, the white part of the eye. This is called melanin. This is the same coloring that you have on the skin when you have a tan, but it means liver hardening from bacteria in the liver, believe it or not. Now, it's not some major health issue that they have to watch out for, but it means, okay, we're going to have to do a liver cleanse with you and, um, you know, strength, you know, maybe tone up the liver a little bit, but you need to cleanse it out for sure. Now, um, so that brown is typical of that. So that usually you can see it really quickly, really easily. Again, I'm trying to give you signs that you can look at that are, you know, pretty basic. You can say, well, okay, brown in the eye, the brown in the whites of the eyes, I know you're going to have to do a liver cleanse because that's called liver hardening. 
<clears throat> you don't have to get into the part about there's bacteria in your liver. Don't even get into the details on it. It's just liver hardening and they have to do a liver cleanse. Now the scurfrim is another thing that we look at. This is typical of a real, these are the kind of models you see that are doing mascara commercials. They got these beautiful eyes as this one is, beautiful blue eye with this dark rim around it. But this represents a physically that's the skin zone. When you see that ring, we know that the skin is weak. Now you look at them, these beautiful models, and they got gorgeous skin, they're smooth and they're makeup models or whatever, but it doesn't mean that their skin is tattered and baggy and wrinkly now, but it's the first thing to start happening as they get a little bit older. The skin starts weakening, it starts sagging, starts wrinkling. And there's two trains of thought on that. And the North American iridologists say, well, this is just weak skin. So skin brushing helps and, you know, hot showers and cold showers, anything to stimulate the blood circulation and, and you know, skin brushing, scrush, uh, scrub up towards the heart. Okay. I had 20, 35 years, I've never seen that work uh, to make these things go away. I've only been doing iridology for 25 years, but in that 25 years, I've never seen everybody, anybody able to do skin brushing and remove that line. I believe what the North, the European iridologists say about that. They say that scurfrim is due to low self-esteem or low self-worth. So um, that never seems to be wrong. It's always accurate. So the darker that line, the more easily that person get hurt their feelings. You know, uh, we always make a joke about poor person like this. They never go to football games because every once in a while the players all get together in a huddle and talk about them. No, but I mean, this is, they're very suspicious. They're thinking people don't like me either. They're, they're talking about me. That's this kind of person. They get hurt very easy to say the wrong thing. Um, so the, there's no expression that says you have to have a thick skin because you get hurt too easy. This person has a very thin skin, as you can see. So it's called the scurfrin. So this person needs to work on self-esteem. And um, so remember when you're looking at somebody like this and you're doing a some kind of a consultation with them, with their diet or something, be careful what you say about their health or their looks or something like that, or their weight, because this person will get their feelings hurt really well. Or, or really quickly, I should say. Um, here's another one. This is very interesting. Every time I do uh, an iridology webinar or um, some seminar where I'm face to face, everyone has to take a break. They leave, they go to the washroom, everyone starts looking in the eye for this one here. It's called radial furrows. Um, the North Americans refer to this as radi radii solaris. And see the spokes coming out like that, these dark spokes? Now, that's a sign of a slow moving toxic colon. It means the colon is not dumping toxins as well as it should. And so those channels are areas where the colon is bleeding toxins into the rest of the body. So you can actually see the different parts of the body that are affected by that. And it also is a good indication that this person has parasites and I mean intestinal worms. So, that's why everyone, now don't get up in the middle of this, this uh, webinar and go check yourself in the mirror for this. You got plenty of time to look later. But this is a person who just can't seem to go to the bathroom enough, but they're holding on to a lot of toxic thoughts from the past. They can't seem to let go of emotions and things of the past. They're typical of the people that tend up getting the radio furrows. And uh, so uh, a good bowel cleansing protocol for this person and also a parasite cleansing protocol. And they think, oh, parasites, don't worry about 80% of the people are walking around with them. And when you start taking a protocol for the parasites, they might see things like corn, rice, or sesame seeds come out into the water. Well, <clears throat> geez, I don't remember eating corn, rice, or sesame seeds. Well, it's not corn, rice, or sesame seeds. That's what the parasites look like when you're taking something, let's say black walnut, turkey, rhubarb, uh, artemisia, or wormwood. Um, so these are things that actually kill it, and then the, they all come out dead, of course. But uh, these are things you need to worry about and get out so they don't stay in there eating up all your nutrients. So that's a good thing to recognize when you're looking at someone's eyes. 
uh, I'm going to recommend you go on a good bowel cleansing protocol and you know, that kind of thing. So um, that's an easy one to see too for me. I, this is another really easy one to see. I've actually done this with horses too. When people are saying, oh, I'm thinking of getting this horse. What do you think? And I just take a look in the eyes and you can actually see this in a horse's eyes. These furrows. So let's imagine my finger is the, my fingers are the fibers that go all around the eyes. And when they're under a lot of stress, there's a constricting pressure that actually causes them to fold and buckle. And this is what you're seeing here is all the buckling of those fibers. And there's quite a few of them here. There's like six in a row. Well, once you've had four or five rings in a row like that, if you already haven't had a nervous or emotional breakdown, you're close to having one. This was six. This is an eight year old girl. This picture. She was an eight-year-old girl. Do you have do you have elevators in this building? I hate elevators. Are you going to use needles? I, I don't want to have needles. I'm so afraid of needles. And she's just going on and on and on. I'm going, kid, take a take a pill. Jeez, chill, you know. But this eight-year-old just panicky, worrying about things all the time. She's so wound up. So when you're stressed and your body produces a lot of stress, uh, acidity, and then I call that because adrenaline itself and norepinephrine, they're like battery acid. Um, and when your body is under a tremendous amount of stress, and I mean really high stress, you just, the doctor found a lump and you don't know what it is, but they're very suspicious. Uh, you just got in a car accident, your spouse just served you papers, um, whatever. You, you, know, you got a house fire or something like that. Under, under high, high, high stress like that, your body can produce over a liter of acid per hour, not per day, per hour. So you're peeing a lot, trying to get rid of the acid. And where does the acid store in the body? In the muscles. So this is a person with a lot of tight, stiff muscles. You can see it. But this is also a person, because basically the, the, the muscle tries to quarantine it. They, they get really, really tense. And then until the body can neutralize it using things like sodium and calcium to neutralize it. And then once that acid is neutralized, the kidneys can filter it out. But uh, when we see these contraction furrows, it means they got a lot of neuromuscular tension. I'm gonna go through this really quickly with you. You see it at the top, this is the brain area. It means the brain's really active, really, really thinking, 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 gerbil on a wheel, gerbil on a wheel. This is what it is, like the brain's always going around. This is the neck and shoulders, lots of tension in your neck and shoulders. This is down through the lung and rib cage. It, they're gonna have a problem with trying to take big, deep breaths. It's very short because the rib cage is tight. And down here at around four o'clock, this is the hand and the arm. They're gonna notice some numbness or tingling in their fingers every once in a while. And down in the ovaries, if it's a female, um, down here at let's say six o'clock in the knee and the feet area, their knees and feet go crack, 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 crack when they bend. And if you're saying this to anybody, they're laughing, oh my gosh, that's me for sure. And a little bit beyond that, right here is the kidney area. So they're gonna probably experience a lot of lower back aches when they wake up. Um, this is the bladder. See that line going right through it? That's the bladder. So they got a weakened bladder. They're gonna have frequency or urgency of urination. They're gonna have to get up and pee in the middle of the night. You know, we call it grandma bladder. Get out of my way, I gotta go to the bathroom kind of thing. And this is the back, all this area. Tightness all through their mid, upper and uh, uh, lower mid and upper back. Um, this is the this is the jaw area. So there's this tendency for them to clench their jaw, their jaw grind their teeth at nighttime like that. And uh, this is the um, forehead area. So if they're going to get a headache, it's going to be in this area right here, right? Typically in the forehead and the eyes area. That's very typical when you see this. Just lots of tension. They're going to need a lot of B vitamins, calcium, magnesium for this person here. Um, an under acid stomach. When you look in the eye, if you look real closely, you can see this very slight, very pale halo. If you see a pale, pale halo around the pupil like that, that's the stomach zone. So when you see that, that's an indication that they have low stomach acid. They're going to get a lot of gas and bloating, specifically after certain things they eat. Um, indigestion, probably foods are, are going to come out and you're going to see uh, undigested food in the stools, things like that, all right? Versus a person like this with a hot, an over acid stomach. Notice it's a really bright ring. 
heavy belching, stiffness of joints, um, you know, things like that, it's very runny or soft stools. Um, that's very, very typical of this person because a lot of acidity is going through their body. What happens with this? That's from taking a lot of NSAID drugs, non-stereo anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, sometimes that's from drinking a tremendous amount of pop or things like that. So things can stimulate the stomach and produce a lot of acidity. Interestingly enough, Harvard Medical School did a study on this. If you see a ring around the pupil, they call that the ring of perfection. That's a person that likes things just so and accurately. They like things done neatly and in order. And they also like to pe teach people what they learned. If I learned something new, I'm so excited. I want to go show somebody what I learned in this iridology presentation today. And uh, that also, when you see that ring, it, it means the person has a hard time digesting life. Now that doesn't mean they're depressed or anything like that. It just means they could be happy, but they just got stress and garbage in life that they have to deal with. And it makes it just difficult. You know, they just have to deal with the hand they've been dealt. So it makes them have a hard time digesting life. And when you have a hard time digesting life, you have a hard time digesting your food. So that's also an emotional thing. And that was Harvard Medical School that discovered this, believe it or not. So they called that the ring of perfection. So it's interestingly to know, does this person need um, protein digestive aids like betaine hydrochloric acid uh, supplementation? No, they've already got an overly amount, over amount of, of uh, stomach acid. But when it's a very dark gray or pale halo, sometimes it's just orange in the middle like that. That means an under acid stomach as well. That person could stand to use more hydrochloric acid. This person could stand to have more enzymes, but uh, not this person. This is just a very over acid stomach. So you want, don't want to give them anything that's going to increase that at all. Okay, so um, another few signs. I'm coming close to an end here. So uh, if you guys uh, I'm good, be patient with me, I'll be wrapped up in a couple minutes here. So this is very typical. You see this with a, a lot of people, very large pupils in a you know, regularly lit room. So if the pupils are very, very large, that's a sign of adrenal exhaustion. Also indicative of a person who has uh, Epstein-Barr. Epstein-Barr, large pupils like that usually indicate people with Epstein-Barr, which means Epstein-Barr is the, the virus that causes mono, mononucleosis. Uh, chronic fatigue, things like that. So when you see that, they need to work on those adrenals. Lots of vitamin C to build up those adrenals. Adrenal herbs or homeopathics, whatever you do to build up those adrenals, bring them back. But they need B vitamins for the, to support their nerves, but also lots of vitamin C to support those adrenals. This is a person who suppresses their stress. Very small, tiny pupil. See that? And when you see a very tiny pupil, it means they hold all their emotion, they hold their stress in. They also need to support their adrenals. So it's whether you're a person with an exhausted adrenals or a person who is just very, very stressed and their adrenals are running white hot like this person, they just need to take B vitamins, calcium, magnesium to relax them. Um, an acidic condition, this is, uh, there's a lot of white fibers, lots of white. Now this is a blue eye, but it looks gray. There's so much white over top of that. That means they're, they're in acidic condition. They're very prone to arthritis or arthritic conditions, rheumatoid arthritis, whatever. A lot of joint pain, stiffness of muscles and things like that. Here's another one here. This is a typical person, when you, get, when you see these people, they got these icy blue eyes or gray, gray, icy, gray eyes. That's a protease deficiency when you see people like that. They're, they, need, they have a calcium metabolism balance and, and probable wheat and, and dairy allergies. They should be staying away from wheat and dairy when you see these icy blue eyes like that. I'm personal uh, belief, my own personal belief is you shouldn't be taking wheat and dairy anyway, but that's my only belief. Um, but this person specifically, so when you see a lot of people like that, they need protease enzyme to help break down proteins, but you should still keep them away from wheat and dairy. And this is a person when you see a lot of orange in an eye, if you look in an eye and it's orange, you know they have blood sugar metabolism imbalances. So you, you, they cannot metabolize sugar that well. So that means they're gonna crave it. 
So that's an amylase deficiency. When you see, you look at an eye and there's any kind of orange in an eye, you know they're gonna need to take more amylase to break down carbohydrates. So this is typically people who with a sugar imbalance or, or they're usually intolerant to it. Here's other additional sugar metabolism signs. You get them to look down and pull up on their eyelid. And if you see these little bruises at the end of the, the blood vessels here, it looks like a little bruise at the end. That's a blood sugar metabolism imbalance sign. It means they're just, they're ferment, it's a fermentation sign, meaning the sugar is actually fermentating or fermenting, pardon me, into alcohol. It's called um, ethanol. So that's not a good sign either. So very, there's some things I'm just showing you, you can tell just by looking at a person's eye, whether they have a problem breaking that down. And uh, the other one is lipase for lipids, fats. This is a lipase deficiency. So when you look at the sclera and you see, it looks like a blob of fat. And every once in a while, you see somebody with a little blob of fat, usually nasal word medial, as opposed to lateral towards the ears. But you can have both sides. But when it looks like this little blob of fats in there, that's uh, an indication that their body doesn't know how to metabolize fat. And so they need more lipase. And if you take lipase with the food to digest the fat in the food, if you take it away from food, it goes into the body looking for foreign proteins or foreign fats to break down. So that's what this person needs. So if you see fat in the sclera, you know they need some something for that. Here's some other things I'll just throw in really quickly. Congestive heart failure diathesis or um, you know, tendency. That's what that means. When you see a vertical line in the left sclera, so they look to tell them, look to your right. And if you look in the left eye and there's a vertical that really stands out, you say, you go get that checked by your doctor. So the brighter a red that is, the more it stands out, the more evident it's going to be that this person is going to have heart failure. So it's not a pleasant thing to want to bring up to somebody, but it saves lives. I've actually had, uh, this is a patient of mine, I said, go leave my office and go to your doctor right away. And the doctor laughed at him and said, oh, pff, you don't believe that stuff. And uh, he says, well, he told me everything else about me that was accurate. I, I'm concerned for my heart. And the doctor says, yeah, you'll never, that's ridiculous. The only way you're going to see a specialist is if you go to uh, an emergency ward. He says, thank you. So he left and went to tell him, he says, my doctor said I'm about to have a heart attack. Now, he didn't say my medical doctor. He just said doctor. So they took him in right away, put him on the, the treadmill and did a stress test on him. And they turned it off after six minutes. They said, turn it off. You're going to kill him. Uh, I don't know what to say. Your heart's all over the place. We're going to have to do an MRI. They put him in an MRI, wheeled him down the hall, put him in an MRI. And when he came out, the cardiologist's face was white. And he says, I don't know how to tell you that. Your uh, right vessel in your heart is 90% blocked and your left one's 85. I don't know how you're still standing, but you're literally hours away from having a massive heart attack. And the kind of heart attack you'll have is you're here, you're fine, you, you, you're dead, you hit the floor. You won't even know what's coming. It's not like, ouch, ouch, my chest hurts, call an ambulance. That's what this line means here. So if you see that in anybody, you need to put them on a program to build up their heart, cleanse their arteries, but you, you've got to tell them to see their doctor and get that checked. Um, uh, opposite of that, this is called apoplexy diathesis or stroke tendency. Um, when you see a vertical line on the right lateral square, right, laterals towards the ear, see that, that vertical line there? If you see that and it's really bright red, it's inevitable they're going to have a stroke. So you've got to get them into the doctor right away, have it all checked out. Um, the doctors will know what to do. So I'm telling you a little bit of things that's not so pleasant, but it does save lives. And that's the end of the show. So I just want to say, um, we do teach this at the Institute of uh, Nutrition. Um, uh, and I, I've been working with them now for, well, IHN for how many years? I think this is my seventh year, Institute of Holistic Nutrition. I've taught at other schools as well, but my favorite is, is IHN, Institute of Holistic Nutrition. Now, for some of you, I would think most of you who are on this, uh, this webinar, you probably are with them or you're graduated students of IHN. But um, if you're not and you're thinking about checking it out, you know, I love the school. They've got a good curriculum. It's, uh, 
it'll see what you're made out of, that's for sure. It's a tough course. And I've seen a lot of courses. This is a good one, but it's exciting. Um, the, the content is excellent. And you come out as really good. Now, I'm, I'm not biased when I say this. I don't work for the Institute of Holistic Nutrition. I'm, I'm a separate practitioner, but I like them and I like their program. And I take a lot of students in my clinic as co-ops and they actually sit with me when I'm working with the clients. And the best trained ones are from IHN. Now there's a plug for you guys, <laughs> but, but slap, pat yourselves on the back because it's a good institution. And, and, I, and I, the program's good, the teachers are great. Um, so uh, one of the things that they've asked me to do is teach iridology. And uh, there are about 20 iridologists, iridology teachers in North America. I'm, I'm one of them, but um, there's not a lot out there. There's not a lot of programs out there. We've seen them. And so we actually teach courses that include North American, which is Bernard Jensen form of iridology, um, uh, European constitution iridology, Australian iridology, we get you into the emotion a little bit. And we talk a little bit about the personalities, RAID. And we also teach you on sclerology and pupil tonus. And this is the only course of its type in North America that covers all of those areas. And I know that because I've checked out all the curriculum and, the, and I'm not saying that just because I'm the one teaching it. I'm just saying that there's something that we wanted to offer that was really special. And we put a package together that trains you in all different types of iridology that's used around the world. So it's on Tuesday evenings from 6.30 to 9.30 if you're interested. Uh, I'm not the one to talk to. You'd have to call into IHN to the office and talk to the uh, somebody there and they'll tell you more about it. Um, Tuesday evenings from 6.30 to 9.30 and it's online. Um, whether that will change depending on the lockdown here, I don't know. So you're going to have to talk to IHN on this, but it's from February to June. It starts in February. It's 16 sessions, which means 16 Tuesdays from 6.30 to 9.30. And it's a total of 50 hours in class time. Anyway, so I'm going to hand this back over um, to your host. And he should pop up there any second now. If not, there, there he is. There you go. Thank you, Rob, for uh, a very eye-opening uh, <laughs> lecture. What am I doing? Uh, no, it was it was super fascinating. Uh, I saw lots of people in the chat uh, talking about it. So thank you for putting together such an awesome presentation. Um, thank you. And for those of you that have been in attendance tonight, um, we will do a draw. I'm going to take a list of all the attendees who are here live, um, and someone's going to win. Uh, a full iridology session uh, with Robert. So um, that's exciting. So we'll, I'll reach out to you um, directly by email um, after we find a winner. Okay, Perfect. thank you everybody for being here. Okay, so that kind of closes off the official uh, webinar, but we're gonna do some Q and A. Um, I'm gonna go back through the chat because I know a lot of you were asking things during the presentation, but if you have new questions, put them in the Q and A try and get to as many as we can. Um, we, have, we have a little bit of time, but we might not get to them all. Um, but while you're putting your questions in the q and I'm just gonna go back through the chat because we had some interesting comments while you were speaking. Um, so one real easy one to get out of the way, actually, Rob, is someone um, didn't catch the name of the book you were talking about when you were talking about the layers and bearing emotions. You mentioned a book. Um... The emotions, feelings buried alive never die. And it's from, here, I'll, I'll grab the book. Give me one second, I'll show you what it looks like. Here it is Feelings Buried Alive Never buy, Die by Carol K. Carol spelt with a K, Carol K. Truman. And it gives you amazing, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Louise Hay. And Louise Hay basically skims over it a little bit, but this goes into real detail on the physiological problem in the body and what emotions are behind it. So it's a great book. Feelings Buried Alive Never Die. Awesome. And then there was an interesting comment when you were talking about the hyperpigmentation and someone said, could you get hyperpigmentation from drug use? Um, you said it's a chemical spot and could cause, be caused by medication. So would you be able to identify street drug abuse in this way? No. Unfortunately, you can't. We just know there's chemicals. 
the chemicals, like I said, they go in the body clearer, but they change because of different emotions we go through. Right. They, they change color. But unfortunately, no, we can't, we can't do that. Otherwise, uh, we'd be working with the police force. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, the blue outer line on the sclera um, that's indicative of low iron, is it only indicative of low iron or other um, issues also? No, it's a, it's a low iron issue. Okay. Uh, it's called a lunula. And, um, but it, typically when you have that blue line, it, whether you are a dark brown eye or a blue eye, if you have a blue outer ring, it's, the blue is actually on the white part of the eye, the sclera, that means you, you have uh, low iron. And what if, uh, so regarding the, the, the scurf rims, um, mm -hmm. if you see this in babies, um, I, well, I guess the question is just what if you see this in babies? <laughs> well, you know, babies can be born with uh, imbalances in their body too. And they're not, they're not getting enough uh, blood circulation to get the uh, oxygen and the, the iron around the body. So there's a possibility of that too. Um, but uh, I wouldn't suggest giving a baby iron right away, but uh, just make sure that the baby is having iron rich foods, but you wouldn't give them, let's say a heme iron or something to constipate them or overheat their blood. But yeah, so you might just want to increase, there's, you can't fully get a lot of iron from a lot of pablum and baby food, the, the infilac, you've, you've seen that baby food infilac out there. It means it's for infants and it lacks everything. That's what I call it. But it's, uh, th there's a lot of nutrients that you can start feeding the baby. And you guys as nutritionists would know how to do that, build up their iron. OK, let's go into the Q&A and see what we got in here. So um, recently, I noticed that uh, some iridologists talking about seeing vitamin D deficiency and also seeing kidney stones, too. Um, what is your thoughts on this? That's not actually seen in the eye, the actual iris is in the sclera that you can see um, the presence of stones and things like that and different deficiencies. So you would see more of that in the sclera than the actual iris. So yes, you can tell, uh, but it wouldn't be an iris um, indication. It would be actual sclera, the whites of the eyes. Okay. Um, referring to the chart and I forget which chart it was now because they said this obviously during your presentation but they said is the spleen thyroid liver etc um, supposed to be overlapping the circulation in skin is there a reason for this yeah if you look at most charts um, a lot of the the zones will come out and it's blunt it's flat which means that's where that zone stops but if it has a rounded edge on it that means it's it could actually overlap the other ones as well this is the way the eye is made. You can see it overlapping. It goes right over top of the circulatory, right over top of the skin. But that's, yeah, you'll see that on certain parts like the thyroid, uh, like you said, the spleen, the liver, things like that. Um, uh, that is uh, even the rectum, the anus, you'll see that uh, overlap like that. And it's supposed to be like that because if you're actually looking at, let's say the rectum and the anus, you'll see the hemorrhoids come where if somebody has hemorrhoids, you can see it come right up to the very edge of the periphery of the eye. Um, and a lot of thyroid issues, the, the, the split will go right to the edge of the actual, the, the, uh, the periphery of the eye. Mm -hmm. So it's just the way it's made, but it should overlap the, the circulatory as well. Yeah. Okay. And of course, the only one, the person asking this is a person who's had iridology training before somewhat. But yeah, that's, that's how it is. It actually does come out over right to the periphery, the uh, outside, right to the edge of the eye. Cool. Um, regarding the ring around the pupil for high stomach acid, what do you usually recommend for that? For high stomach acid? Yeah. Um, well, you have to ask them questions first off. Do you take any kind of NSAID, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug? No. Um, do you, are you a heavy pop or coffee drinker? Or do you drink a lot of orange or black Pico teas? Things like that. So it's usually an indication of a person who is doing something to stimulate that to overproduce too much uh, hydrochloric acid in the stomach. Um, sometimes 
it's an indication that they once had an under acid stomach and it's built up a lot of, let's say, Helicobacter pylori, H. pylori bacteria. And then the stomach hyperproduces hydrochloric acid to that one spot to try to kill it off. And, but that doesn't usually stay the whole eye like that, stay, stay uh, on a hypoacidic eye like that, or a hyperacidic, I should say, a very white ring. But that's usually from a person who has had a lot of NSAID drugs. There's been some damage to the, the stomach from certain things you've had or taken that usually would cause that. And that usually doesn't last that long before it becomes hypoacidic or under acid. So, but what would you take? I would say more like what, instead of what asking, what can I take? What can I take away that's mm -hmm. causing that problem? Very good. If that answers your question. Yeah. <laughs> um, what happens if there's a dark brown spot in the white of the right eye? In the sclera, in the actual sclera itself. Yeah dark brown spot, that's a melanin spot. That's all it is. Now, was it once red or is it just brown? If it's just brown, that's melanin. It's not a condition in the body, oh, oh I'm in trouble, there's a, some disease going on. Uh, whenever you see melanin in the sclera, it just means I'm gonna have to do liver cleanses, that's all. So not to worry about it. That's a simple thing that's, we see a lot of that in a lot of people, it's nothing to worry about. And what's a good book that you'd recommend for somebody who's interested in iridology and wants to potentially learn a little bit more and kind of looking for a place to start? Well, there are places you can get. If you call, um, I think it's Jensen International, if I'm not mistaken, from Bernard Jensen. If you just Google Bernard Jensen, they can send you a little booklet on it. Um, and it's called Iridology Simplified. That's what really got me interested in it. Now, I don't believe in just reading a book and learning self-taught iridology. It just doesn't work that way. And I'm not trying to be biased and tell you to take a course, but it's a really good place to start. It's called Iridology Simplified and um, just Google Bernard Jensen or Bernard Jensen International, something like that. And it has an online store that you can actually order that. I think it's about $13 for that book. And uh, it's really good. It really takes you through all the basics and you have a good overall understanding how uh, iridology works. So that's a good one. Iridology Simplified. Very cool. Yeah, Bernard Jensen, what a, what a trailblazer and pathfinder he was. He was, he was also a nutritionist. Yeah, yeah, we use one of his books. Yeah, we use um, we use one of his books in our fundamentals course. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, great stuff. Um, if you have blue eyes with brown around the pupil, will the brown eventually go away if you treat the underlying issue? It will fade. It'll never go away. That's permanently stained. Now I'm going to tell you because I don't know who this is, and we don't really need to know who this is. But that's a blue eye with brown. Is it? orange or is it brown? If it's brown, that's from suppressing anger. A lot of anger, childhood issues, whatever, but they hold it all in. They don't let it all out. So they may not be an angry person per se, but they do have suppressed anger. When it goes closer, when the color goes closer towards the pupil, we know that they're suppressing emotions. If there's a lot of orange that goes towards or dark orange towards the pupil, that means a long-term lack of joy that they're holding in. But if it's brown, that's liver. And I mean, that's, uh, that's anger, but that anger affects the liver. So you need to do a liver cleanse, but I'm gonna warn you, that person who has the the brown tucked around the pupil, you start doing a liver cleanse and boy, all this anger starts coming out. I'll tell you that right now. Because this anger is associated with the liver. And if you start cleansing that liver, it all starts coming out. I was driving down the highway one time and I don't know what I did. Some guys honk, honk, and go, what? He's blah, 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 blah. I had to almost open a dictionary to find out what he was trying to say to me, but he was swearing at every possible foul thing he could say and then threw a cup of coffee at me and it hit my windshield and splat right over my windshield and it looked like it had cream and sugar um, and I didn't even order that but I just said to him go clean out your liver and he looked at me really strange and drove off but so you can always tell people if they're going to have an anger issue especially if they have brown in night not that person who says I got brown in this in the white of my eye I'm talking brown on the in the on the actual iris so 
that's what that typically means. If you see that, do a liver cleanse. Okay. And a colon cleanse, by the way. All colon right. Liver. Yeah. Um, so someone's just asking, they missed obviously when we were talking about the, the course that you're going to be doing with IHN, uh, if it's online, it's online, uh, or at least it's online for now. Um, but they're also wondering if there are any special tools that are required um, in order to identify these things. No, well, we uh, will, there's a real simple tool that I've got here. It's got a light, it's a built-in light to it. And this is a uh, 10 magnification. Um, and you would hold it over the eye and you can see things really clearly. I can't remember exactly what that goes for. It's about 40, 50 bucks, something like that. Um, it's hard to get one with that kind of a magnification with a light and it's a nice clear light. And then we have some charts available for people and the charts go, I think our most expensive one is 20 bucks or 22 bucks or something like that. So there may be a chart or two or five or we, we make a, a several of them available I'll actually hold them up on screen and I'll show them uh, in the course if they want to buy them but it's not prerequisite the only one I recommend that is is it's compulsory would be the scope and the basic iris chart that I showed in the webinar so those two together are the only things you'd need and you know you could take this scope and that chart and I can go anywhere in the world and practice iridology. So it's not a heavy overhead type of uh, practice you'd have to have. So it's, it's, it's very light. And I used to practice. I had five clinics on the go all the time. And I had a scope and I had a chart. And that's what I went to do. I just went around back and forth between Vancouver. And then we drive down to Seattle and another clinic down there. But I worked in White Rock, actually. And then I had four other clinics here in uh, Oakville, or in uh, Ontario. Um, so you can really go a long way without having to spend a lot of money. Cool. Uh, we'll do two more questions and then we'll, we'll call it a night. So um, does the blue around the iris of the eye go away once treated with iron? Yes, yep, fades right away, very, very quickly too. And so you can look in your eye and say, gee, I'm a little bit low on iron. Another thing I said, you can do the ring. But uh, as soon as you start taking enough iron, that blue ring goes away. And uh, you don't get that dark line on your face when you rub it, a gold onto it. So yes, it'll go away really quickly. Um, and finally, if your eyes start changing from more brown to green, is this problematic? No. I used, to, I used to joke about that. I remember this one person came in. This only happened once, but I remember a lady come in. She says, now, and this lady, who she was about 26 years old, and she brought her mother, which was in her 50s, and she says, now, why is it that my mother's eye changed from brown to bluey green in four weeks? Now, it's very rare that it would change that fast, but the more you cleanse, the, the lighter your eye would get in this case. And uh, so I could only explain it, the more, the more, the more you are full of it, <laughs> your eyes are brown. You know, there's no expression that says the, the, you know, when you're really full of it, your eyes go brown. Well, when you do a lot of cleansing, your eyes start losing that darker color and it goes more of a greeny and then more of a bluey green after that. So that's a good sign when your eyes actually change from brown to green. It means you've gotten rid of a lot of toxins. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Rob, for taking the time to do this. Um, I know I learned quite a bit, so I'm sure everyone attending did as well. Good. Excellent. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And uh, yeah, if you're interested in more, um, contact Julia, julia at instituteofholisticnutrition.com. If you have questions about registering for uh, Robert's course, um, she'll have all the info and details and all that good stuff. Um, you can email me as well, but I'll probably end up linking Julia into the conversation anyway. Okay. <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being a good audience. And I, I didn't hear any chatter. I'm kidding. And all your mics are turned off, but thank you very much. And it was a pleasure bringing this to you and what I'm passionate about. Hopefully you find it too. Take care. Great. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.